Hello and welcome to the First Strike Podcast, your weekly dose of conservative news brought to you by Restoration of America. I'm your host, Hayden Ludwig, Research Director for Restoration News. Joining us today is Jeff Reynolds, Senior Investigative Researcher for Restoration News, with a smashing new report tying global elites and the militant left to pro-Hamas riots across the nation. You can find Jeff's report linked in the show notes and also at restoration-news.com. Jeff, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Hayden. Good to be back with you, and I'm uh, really going to enjoy this, I think. I think we will, too. So set the stage for us. Let's go back to October 7th, 2023, you know, the day that will live in infamy for Israelis. Talk about the Hamas attack, but also the West's response, and in particular, progressives in the United States. Yeah, you know, it started out as a, uh, a typical response. It was very much like 9-11 for us. And you know, a lot of people compared it to or, you know, described it as Israel's 9-11. Uh, there were so many people killed and maimed and injured and, and tortured and burned and all of the rest. And the world kind of united for about a day and a half uh, behind Israel. And, oh, my God, what did uh, Hamas? do to these people. And then it sort of slowly morphed and uh, you saw the the progressive radical uh, extreme left really start to uh, push back even even as they were still counting bodies they started saying well you know israel's uh, justified in responding to these attacks but let's make it reciprocal let's not make it uh something that where they they destroy hamas altogether you know let's let's just have a proportional response and they th- it's always the progressive radical left that defines what pr- what uh proportional and and uh, 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 what the proportional response is. Uh, they never sure. actually say what proportional is, because if it was actually proportional, then they would do all the things to Hamas that Hamas did to the innocent civilians at that music festival. So before we get into the specifics of these pro-Hamas riots that broke out in hundreds of campuses around the country, every major city outside the White House even, I want to talk about all those things. The interesting point at the heart of your report is that really all of these anti-Israel groups are fundamentally anti-American, but more broadly anti-Western. And we saw this with the chance of death to America. And you go, well, what does that have to do with anything? But to these people, it's everything to do with everything. So explain what you mean by that. Yeah, that's a really important point. And that gets back to this idea of intersectionality that Kimberly Crenshaw coined as part of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is rooted in Marxism, cultural Marxism, uh, and uh, everything that flowed out of the uh, Communist Manifesto. This all goes back to the same root, uh, the same, same philosophical root uh, as Marxism as uh, socialism, the whole thing. And and it is, it's all 100% focused on not Israel. Israel is just a punching bag for the globalist mm. Marxist movement. Uh, the George Soros's, the Bill Gates, those types of folks, the uh, Klaus Schwab's. Uh, it, it's Israel, I mean, obviously Israel has the added uh, burden of being rooted in Judaism and having the anti-Semitism, the, the, the historic anti-Semitism that everybody kind of focuses on. But really what this is, more broadly than that even, is it's an anti-Western movement that is designed to tie all of these things together that are getting in the way of the workers' revolt that uh, they the globalists want to see. They want to see the dominant power structures subverted. Uh, they accuse us of, of being, us being the United States and the West in general, of being imperialist when it really is the, the Marxists that are the imperialists. They simply want to undermine our base of power. So you used a lot of words there that may not be familiar to a lot of listeners. Let's just talk, I want to focus in on one of them, that is intersectionality. Uh, Let's compare it to a term that our listeners probably are aware of, and that's social justice. What does intersectionality mean? What the heck does that have to do with butchering Israeli children in October? Explain these connections, because we need to understand 
this kind of cynical Marxist, you know, philosophy that it's at the heart of these pro Hamas rioters. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, intersectionality is an outgrowth of critical theory. Uh, we, we're all familiar with critical race theory. Uh, we're starting to become uh, familiar with critical gender theory, critical economic theory, uh, cl critical le legal theory. It all goes back to critical theory, which is an uh, intellectual framework that justifies Marxism and the, the uh, long march of Marxists through our social institutions. Intersectionality is a, is defined as uh, where, for instance, um, uh, it was Kimberly Crenshaw who coined this term. She talks about the intersection of being black and being a female and being queer. All of those, the intersection of all of the supposed different types of oppression that they feel from Western civilization. Now, there's nothing legal or you know justified or or actually happening that's oppressing these people like they claim they are but they all because of the labels that they give themselves they claim the mantle of oppression and therefore they have justice on their side that's what social justice is is to undermine the structures of oppression social justice is actually the opposite of justice as we understand it in our constitutional system because our constitution sets up equal justice for all. But social justice claims that we have somehow ignored justice for anybody who's not a, an old white male, uh, probably a slave owner to boot. <laughs> okay, so so two points stand out here. The first is the, the philosophy and thought is much more complex than simple radical Islam. That's one thing. And it's also much older than that. We're, Marxism, I mean, we're taking all the way back to the late 19th century here. And obviously, when you say cultural Marxism, you're not talking about workers versus capital. You're talking about something a little more amorphous, the way that the same kind of ideas that power Black Lives Matter. I'd like you to focus in on that. But also, you know, explain to us how in this country, these same radicals on the left would consider Jews an oppressed minority, and yet in Israel, they're screaming that Jews are the oppressor and the Arab Muslims are the oppressed minority. Square that for us if it's even humanly possible to do so. <laughs> Yeah, th th there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. um, so uh, I, I'd say that um, the, the radical Islamic pro-jihad movement finds common cause with the uh, cultural Marxism movement, the Marxist movement in general, the globalist movement. The globalist movement is essentially the bringing together a basis of power to undermine Western culture because the culture of freedom, liberty, and economic, uh, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> uh, prosperity, uh, e economic prosperity is uh, antithetical to uh, Marxism, obviously. And so they're bringing together all these diff disparate movements to uh, create a base of power that's on par with Western civilization. Now, uh, I, I said that uh, Islam and, or Islamists, radical Islamists and jihadists find common cause with uh, with the Marxist movement because they also believe in a top-down command economy and a command society. That's what cultural Marxism is, is a command society modeled after a, a command economy. So uh, that's, that, that's why Marxists and jihadists actually have a lot more in common than it, than it seems like. Do you think that most of the college students, and we know that most of the protesters at these student rallies are actually not college students, they're somebody else, maybe paid, you know, maybe professional agitators, maybe just lunatic wingnuts from the left. But do you really think that most of these college students understand everything you just said when they go to these riots? Or is it for them more of a vibe thing, you know, reliving the 60s glory days that their professors tell them about all the time? Yeah, I, I think there's definitely that second part is is a strong element to it. Um, hmm. They they you talk about there being paid consultants. They actually call them protest consultants. There's a whole <laughs> thing. 
<laughs> that the uh, the radical left foundations that you and I have researched for years actually pay for these fellowships, these these paid positions in in these uh, campus protests. So it's they're they're called protest consultants. They go in, they they rile up the masses, and they show them how to be radicals like their their grandparents were in the '60s, uh, and and then they just sort of you know wind up the 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 little robots and watch them march march across the campus green and uh but uh yeah there's there's a lot more that goes into it than just a bunch of radical students that have been radicalized by their their professors there's so much more organization and coordination and i go into a, a deep de detail in my report on that so not only will the revolution be catered it will also be thoroughly consulted we know this now from jeff reynolds so at Absolutely. the uh, an important myth we hear all the time perpetuated by the radical left, but increasingly members of the Democratic Party in Congress in the Biden administration, is that Israel is this apartheid state, obviously a reference to South Africa codifying racist laws meant to keep a minority in power, although, of course, it's far more complex than even that. Um, is that true? And secondly, is the Israeli government, is it their secret invidious policy to actually commit genocide against the Palestinian people? Is there any basis in truth of these accusations? Absolutely not. And this is just a marketing campaign they invented in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. They uh, <clears throat> they saw the, uh, the success that the worldwide community had when they came together against the ruling white minority in South Africa in the 80s. And they basically co-opted the term apartheid for Israeli culture as well. Uh, I don't recall the South African white minority government having any blacks in its uh, in its Congress or in its parliament. Right. Uh, whereas uh, in Israel, there are Arabs in the Knesset. There are uh, all kinds of uh, ethnic and religious uh, groups, minorities, majority, whatever, in uh, representing uh, uh, the people in parliament. They're allowed to be part of the culture. They're allowed to be part of the government, and they're allowed to help in the lawmaking process. So the idea that it's an apartheid state is absurd on its face. And this goes back to uh, terrorists in the 60s and 70s, people like Leila Khaled, who was a, uh, a, a, a airplane hijacker uh, who is all is now she's a very famous stylized image now and uh, she's become the sort of the face of the Palestinian terrorist movement um, and she's idolized like Mumia Abu Jamal or some other radicals like that you know so um, but that all goes back to them trying to find a, a, a message that would connect with the international community and uh, reflect Israel falsely in a bad light yeah, right. And exactly. And the international community is very primed to take moral outrage at any accusation of genocide. So they, they knew exactly what they were doing. You, you mentioned yep. this being a marketing tactic, and it is interesting. Not many people are aware that the origin of the Palestinian identity as a nation, not the people who actually live there, but this idea that there's one nation that was conquered by the modern Israeli state or something like that, actually was very much invented in the 1960s, not that yep. old, with intervention from the Soviet Union. It was KGB agents working with, I believe it was Yasser Arafat, correct me if I'm wrong, who concocted yeah. a lot of this. And the entire purpose of this was to drive a wedge between the United States and its ally in Israel. And uh, while the Soviet Union was working with Yasser Arafat, there were other activists going over to New York City and working with Madison Avenue ad agencies to come up with wow. a, a marketing campaign for that. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's all an invention. So I want to get now into the meat of this and talk about the organizations that you've actually charted very extensively, the people, the funders, et cetera basically the professional agitators and consultants who are actually running the supposedly organic crusade against these horrible genociding Israelis. Let's start by talking about maybe the broadest one, and that is BDS, the BDS movement. Jeff, what is that? So that's uh, boycott, divest, and sanction. This is a uh, an outgrowth of, it's, it's kind of the same thing as the uh, outgrowth of the um, apartheid 
label where they are taking uh, in the 80s they were very successful in putting pressure on the uh, south african government by divesting all of their investments uh you know both financially as well as you know business doing business in south africa directly uh and that put out so much um economic pressure on the country that they had to change. Uh, so they started out with that same kind of idea, trying to divest from uh, Israel. Uh, the National Association of Scholars has done great work on this. They did a report basically showing that BDS is uh, an excuse for anti-Semitism that uh, mm. the academic elites uh, want to express, but they can't openly express it because, you know, anti-Semitism is bad. And so they, they came up with BDS instead. You know, they want to boycott Israel's businesses and they want people to uh, stay away from doing business with Israel in, instead of just saying, hey, I don't like the Jewish people. You know, we, we don't like the government. And it, so they say it's an anti-Zionist uh, movement. It, it, nothing could be further from the truth. It's, it's all anti-Semitism and it's all anti-West uh, in a bigger uh, package. So anti-Zionist and anti-Semite, are they the same thing? Well, you know, it is a complicated answer. I think if you lived before 1947, I believe is the founding of Israel, right? You could, you could be an anti-Zionist, that is you oppose the founding of a Jewish state without being anti-Semitic. But post founding of Israel now, and we're what eighty years into this country's existence, it's pretty hard to say that you can you can undo the the entirety existence of the Jewish state without also being broadly anti Semitic. Is it okay to conflate these things, or should we take them at their word that no, really, they're just anti Zionists, deeply concerned with this, and not at all anti Semitic? No, I, I I don't think you can. I think I think a lot of the casual uh, observers don't really make the distinction, and so there, uh, some folks unwittingly go into it to answer your previous question about whether the uh, college students understand what they're getting into. Some a lot of them probably don't understand the the complexity and the the huge issue that we have here, but. A lot of folks do, and a lot of folks just simply hide behind being anti-Zionist when, in fact, they are uh, nakedly anti-Semitic. So it, it's a big problem. So tell us more about these organizations, and, and also, what do they get out of all of this? What's in it for them? Uh, which organizations uh, specifically but, are you referring talk to? Talk more about the organizations that are responsible for this. So we've talked about BDS, but talk more about some of the organizations. Some of them have very Jewish names, like Jewish Voice for Peace, for instance, which is anything mm. but, but give us some specifics. Well, so Jewish Voice for Peace is is a front group. Uh, they they are a pro communist group, uh, pro Palestine group uh, that's put Jewish in the name, and they have very liberal, very progressive Jews who were founders of the organization. But those Jews are very strongly anti Israel, and there's a there's a real strong uh, um, element of that in anti Israel. Or, or in the, the Jewish community in America, you've got a real problem with them uh, latching on to the uh, strong, radical, progressive leftist movement, including Marxism, including globalism, including anti-Israel causes. And it, it, again, it's, it's just all part of the same thing. And uh, it, it's, it's the progressive radical identity for some folks is more important than their Jewish identity. But what do they aim to gain out of this? Obviously, you know, uh, the eradication of the Israeli state would be a big thing, especially if you're a Palestinian Arab, a member of Hamas. But for a well-heeled organization based in Manhattan, what's the ultimate objective? What, what's their skin in the game here? Uh, they are like every other globalist uh, group, every other grievance studies group. They 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 exist to invent 
reasons to have grievances and, and reasons to believe that they're oppressed. And when they invent those uh, reasons, then they have something to fight against. And so what they're trying to accomplish, I, I guess, is to end all oppression or end all isms or, you know, and end the Western he hegemony or whatever it is, you know, empire or whatever they're uh, but I, I don't even think they've really defined any specific objectives that would make sense that would lead to an ordered, more free, more liberated society. I, I, in fact, I think they want the opposite. They want a more top-down command society, uh, and they don't care about individual liberty or the American uh, ideals of freedom and, and uh, property and that sort of thing. But it strikes me too that it's also a very convenient and powerful way to control the next generation, right? I mean, if this is the only thing that 18, 19 year olds are hearing when they go to Columbia or Yale or Harvard, right? You're gonna, the idea being, you're gonna own those people for the rest of their lives. And that translates mm -hmm. into a permanent legion of marchers and protesters, but also of course, democratic voters. I, I mean, I think you're right when it comes back to Marxism, but Marxism ultimately always goes back to power. And you can see that their idea of justice is just a, a thinly veiled power grab. Really, it's actually about revenge for, for grievances, you're right. But it always goes back to what gives me more money and more control. I mean, wouldn't you agree with that? Oh, without question. It's 100% a struggle for power. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't believe in liberty and freedom they don't believe they, they believe that liberty and freedom are antithetical to power and they're right about that the, the the idea of american liberty allows everybody to have the freedom to pursue their own happiness however they choose without consideration to power but that then completely upends their world view and so we can't have that it really is about creating power structures, validating power structures, and then seizing the power structures. That's all they care about. And there's a lot of money to be made in this too. Uh, you talk sure. a lot about the role of big philanthropy in organizing these mm -hmm. pro-Hamas riots. Talk about that. Yeah, there's there's hundreds of billions of dollars that I've dug up just on a cursory search uh, wow. that go an annually into these groups, into these protest groups. You know, it's the same people that were funding BLM. It's the same people that were funding Occupy Wall Street. It's the same people that were behind the World Trade Organization riots in Seattle in 1999. It's a direct line, and that goes back to the 60s. That goes back to the uh, the socialists and the uh, communists that came over from Europe in the 30s uh, in New York City that I mean, it, the, the more I dig, the more it's just a straight line. And, you know, there, it's not even all that complicated. You just have to look. So as we close out here, you do actually propose some solutions to all this, right? We're not just exposing, we're actually offering what people can do and take action on this. And give us some top level ones that people should know about. Yeah, I, I think we are long overdue for big philanthropy reform in America. Uh, we have so many uh, bad actors that have taken advantage of the IRS codes around uh, 501c3, c4, 527s, you know, uh, education groups, political groups, the unions, the whole thing. I think um, if, if we scrap the IRS, that would be a good start. <laughs> and I think that, <laughs> Not that uh, honestly, man, yeah, no, no, yeah, <laughs> Stop, <laughs> baby steps. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I, I, I honestly think that uh, they've taken advantage of this, uh, you know, donor-directed funding that was started by the Tides Foundation in the seventies, uh, and George That's Soros right. has taken that and run with it with the Open Society Foundations, and his son Alex Soros has de has declared he's going to become a lot more political now that he's taken over the uh, $14 billion uh, fortune that uh, George Soros left in the Open Society Foundation. So we've got a lot of uh, uh, big reforms that we need to do. We need to root out 
the enemies of the West. We need to expose them. We need to uh, prosecute them for violating federal crimes. We need to uh, investigate as many of these people as we can. Um, I, I, the, again, the more I dig, the more I, uh, I firmly believe I've become a hawk on this. We have to start exposing America's enemies and uh, uh, prosecuting them where we can. Well, extremely well said. Fascinating, Jeff. Remember, folks, you can find this at our website, restoration-news.com. Jeff Reynolds, thanks for coming back on the show. We appreciate your time today. Thanks, Hayden. It's always a pleasure. And let me thank you folks for tuning in and supporting conservative voices like Jeff's working to expose the truth about the rot spreading through this once great country. Remember that it's only by working together and by praying together that we can restore the United States of America to greatness under almighty and sovereign God. I'm Hayden Ludwig. Join us next time as the battle rages on. First Right, a new kind of news summary without the liberal slant. Every morning, in your inbox, always free. Subscribe by texting First Right to 30161. That's First Right, all caps, one word, to 30161.